It's time for the double stop with Brian Sword. Welcome to the double stop. I'm Brian Sword. This week on the show, I have Stevie Rochelle from Tough and the website Metal Sludge. Stevie's somebody I've been trying to get on the show for a while, especially after I had my interview with Andrew McNeese from MelodicRock.com. I wanted to get the other main rock news website from that era, which was Metal Sludge. I think people forget just how huge of a site it was in its heyday, so I want to talk to Stevie about it and get his insight on how it all went down. Of course, I had my Howard Benson interview a couple weeks ago, of which he talked about Stevie Rochelle, so I think maybe that helped the timing a little bit to get him on the show, but I'm glad he came on and it was a great chat. Now this is a long one, folks. Between the music and the website, there was a lot to cover. So this interview will be a two-parter. This week is mainly about the music, and next week we'll talk about Sludge. So let's jump right into it. This is part one of my two-part conversation with Stevie Rochelle. I was born and raised in Wisconsin, Oshkosh, Wisconsin, and um, I graduated high school barely. <laughs> and uh, but you know, for whatever reason, uh, I, I knew even uh, in middle school. I, I just I, I wasn't into school, you know. Um, by the time high school started and kids were talking about where they were going for college and making plans, I was like. I was kind of looking at it like, especially in our, you know, what, junior year, senior year, I'm thinking, hold it, I- I've been doing this for 11, 12 years straight, I'm not planning another four years, <laughs> you know, no college for me, which, you know, later in life, look back at that and think, you know, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I mean, you can you can look at it any way you want, I know guys with great college educations and all kinds of degrees that are broke as fuck. So, you know, um, yeah, born and raised in Wisconsin, lived there till I was 21. Uh, and at that point I moved to Los Angeles and, uh, in pursuit of, you know, following, uh, you know, if you want to sound cliche here, uh, sounds cliche following a dream, you know, I wanted to move to Los Angeles and, and pursue music. Um, far as musical background in the family, uh, the house I grew up in, essentially none, zero. But um, my grandfather, my mother's father, he was pretty musical in the way that at every um, Christmas or Thanksgiving gathering that we'd be at his house, he played an organ. I say organ, not piano, but he had you know, an old organ with uh, all the different foot pedals and made all those kind of uh, Hammond organ sounds and did a lot of um, polka kind of style stuff, you know. And he also played the accordion. Um, so he would uh, do that and do Christmas songs and whatever, but then he'd also make up goofy songs and kind of sing goofy stuff and kind of ad-lib and do it with the kids. And uh, I always remember being intrigued by that. You know, that he was uh, essentially a little bit of an entertainer and a performer and kind of had us all looking at him and at the end of our seat as he was, you know, center of attention with his accordion or the piano and uh, or, or organ and playing, uh, playing the holiday stuff, but also playing some goofy stuff, which, you know, that for some reason stuck with me. So that stuck with you. And then in terms of your high school age, how old were you and how did you start the music side? Well... It's funny, you know, I wasn't really into rock music um, until really late. Uh, You know, growing up, oddly, I I was infatuated with skateboarding, uh, even though I lived in Wisconsin. And it started in the mid-70s. I was probably about eight or nine years old. And um, my friend had one of these little plastic puffy skateboards with, you know, the really, the really, uh, quick angled tail. Like it was almost like a, like a, a little wave thing on the back of the board. You know, it wasn't even a real kicktail. It was like 
just this little plastic kind of hook. And I remember we used to push each other. You used to push down the street and see you could coast the farthest. Well, I became obsessed with skateboarding. And so by 1978, I was 12 years old, and not only was it just something we did in the, you know, in the driveway or in the street, but we were buying magazines, um, Skateboard World or Wide World of Skateboarder, and, and we were going to the, you know, the, the, the sports store, which had a little section with skate stuff, and it had trucks and wheels and decks and stickers and so I, I became more and more obsessed with skating to the point where we were building ramps. And then we were going to other people's houses that had ramps. And eventually we went to this place in Milwaukee called the Surf and Turf Skate Park. Now that was the end of 79, 80. So I'm 13, 14. And the culture of skateboarding uh, also had a lot of music that, that surrounded it. And that music was The Clash and... Uh, the Boomtown Rats and the B-52s and Devo and, you know, the Surf Punks and uh, all those kind of bands. So we would go to these, you know, little places where we'd skate at ramps and stuff and people would have tapes, you know, uh, Black Flag, uh, JFA, you know, these kind of bands in the early 80s. And so I would go to these places and hear these songs and become, you know, intrigued by some of it or a lot of it because it was part of the culture. And at the same time, um, well, not the same, but pretty close, uh, at the end of 81 is when MTV kicked off. And then, um, you know, we're watching MTV, and anybody in that generation remembers, you know, the first videos were just a, wow, just a mishmash of weird stuff, you know, missing persons <laughs> yeah. with mental hopscotch and Gary Newman with cars and Dexy's Midnight Runners and Ice House and, you know, so many of those bands. And I was really, really into all those bands, the split ends. Um, I, I was just really into those bands, the Boomtown Rats. I was just so obsessed with all these weird new wave and punk and, and uh, obscure bands, but I was mainly introduced to them through skating and then through MTV. And so I, I really liked a lot of these bands and I actually owned a lot of those records on vinyl, Madness, the specials, you know, all of it, um, ska, punk, new wave. Uh, so I was really into the stuff. I was really into the music, but I never said to myself, like, I want to sing in a band like, the split ends or Devo, you know, like I, I just never had that interest. But uh, by the time I was a senior, a junior in high school, I was what, 17, maybe three. Some of my friends were getting more into like uh, lover boy, Def Leppard, uh, Rush, uh, Triumph, you know, um, it seems like there was a lot of Canadian bands we were somehow exposed to. But then again, I was in Wisconsin, which is only, you know, where I was, was only a four hour trip from the border, you know? So, um, I say rush and I say triumph, but I also would throw in, you know, when I did get into the, the heavy metal stuff a little bit, I, I suddenly discovered Helix right away and Killer <laughs> Dwarfs and, and, um, were you getting Canadian radio so, then? Well, you know, it is the Midwest, you know, and so, you know, obviously I was in Wisconsin, but, you know, a lot of that stuff kind of bled over into the Midwest and probably the northern part of the Midwest faster than it would, like, into Florida or Texas, you know oh, what I'm saying? Yeah, so, absolutely, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, by the time I moved to L.A., like, I, I had my favorites, you know, I, I love Slave Raider, who was from Minneapolis, and most people didn't know the fuck they were, you know, unless you lived in... Wisconsin or Minnesota or maybe caught them on Headbangers Ball that one or two times, you know, so, but it was my friends who were really into a bunch of this stuff. And then I remember some friends saying they went to see Loverboy in concert, you know, and I mean, I, I didn't really know anything about following bands other than I knew that they had a ton of cool songs on the radio. Everybody's working for the weekend, you know, like, and, uh, you know, they had their red leather pants and their videos were all over MTV. So then the next thing that everybody was, everybody was just obsessed with Def Leppard with the Pyromania record. I mean, it just was huge, you know? And so, uh, 
it was right after the first of the year, 84, I'm now a senior, and my friend said Kiss was coming in concert. So I, I didn't know anything about Kiss. I mean, I knew that the one guy spit blood, you know, I mean, <laughs> his tongue was like a snake. Like, that, I mean, if you would have asked me at that point, which guy is Paul Stanley and which guy is Gene Simmons, I probably wouldn't have known, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, now, this is, this is you know, January, February of 1984. So just to go to show you how much I wasn't into heavy metal or rock and roll, I didn't know who they were. I mean, I, I knew, I knew, like if somebody would have played Bath or rock and roll, you know, party all every, uh, rock and roll party every day or whatever, if they would have played those songs, that would have been, oh, yeah, that's, you know, if they would have given me a, uh, you know, a, a multiple choice. Is this Kiss, Devo? Or, you know, Blondie, I would have probably got the answer right, but I just was not into those bands. But um, my friends all were going to go. It was the Lick It Up tour. We went. It was Kiss, Vandenberg, and Heaven that opened. And I remember going to the show, and I thought, Gene was this ugly-looking man. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Paul was doing his raps, and, yeah. you know, Eric had a big drum set. And I thought, I told all my friends, they go, that guy's the coolest guy. I'm pointing at Vinnie Vincent, you know. <laughs> <laughs> He's got his fucking pink guitar and, you know, feathers in his hair and just like, you know, totally androgynous, overly made up, overly overplaying, over running around, just like, look at me. And, and of course, you know, that's the guy that I thought looked cool. Um, and uh, so I went to see that concert, you know, and I, I, you know, like the song, look it up. And, and then it was a month later that my friend said Ozzy was coming. Um, and there was a, there was a, there was a place, a little music store called the Mad Hatter in Oshkosh that you could buy a ticket for the concert and get a bus ride down to Madison, to Dane County Coliseum. And I want to say it was like 12 bucks, you know, and that was for like the ticket and the bus ride and everything. So, Everybody was going to go. I scraped together 12 bucks or whatever, and I bought a ticket. And so, you know, we're going, to, we're, we're, in the, we're in the bus, and everybody's talking and telling their stories. And I don't know anything about Ozzy, except for one thing. What is that one thing? That he was in Sabbath? No, that, that he eats bats on stage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's all I knew. This is the guy that eats fucking bats. You know, I'm like, okay, we're going to see the guy that eats bats. You know, so I, I knew nothing about Ozzy. You know, if you would have given me that answer, if you would ask me what band was he in, I would have known that. My goodness. Know? Yeah. And at this point, it's, it's you know, March of 84. I'm 18 years old. I'm a senior in high school. Not into rock, not into heavy metal, nothing. Uh, short, feathered hair, like, you know, Leaf Garrett or something. And, uh, so we, we go, we're, we're in the, in the bus on the way down there. And then there was some fans that had a Motley Crue shout at the devil gatefold album. Um, I had no idea who they were. I never heard anything about them. I just knew that everybody in the bus was talking about them and it turned out that they were the opening act. And so there was a bunch of kiss fans on the bus who were basically just destroying Motley Crue, you know, Oh, they ripped them off. I remember everybody like, and then I remember them holding up the record cover and me looking at it and thinking, yeah, that kind of looks like, you know, the demon guy or whatever. Like I'm looking at Mick who looks mean and scary and, you know, and then I look at the, you know, Vince has kind of got the bleached hair, like Ace really had silver hair. So I'm like, well, he's the one that looks like the space guy, you know, and, I thought Tommy Lee looked like Paul Stanley. So, of course, I took the side of everyone that was a Kiss fan. Like, yeah, they're totally ripping Kiss off. Like, I was just so long for the ride. I didn't know what the fuck I was doing, you know. And then um, we got to Dane County Coliseum in Madison. And, you know, we walk in. There's thousands of people walking around. And it was general admission. So, next thing you know, we're down in front of the stage. And I remember the lights went out. And the place just went nuts. I mean, people were just screaming and I could smell, you know, the dry ice or whatever. And then I heard, 
the good always overpower. I heard, you know, that spoken intro, and I, I swear to God, and I've told this story before, the hair on my arms is standing up right now. I was instantly like, what in the fuck is that? You know? And um, as the music started, I looked up, and I was only a few rows from the front, and I saw this fucking, you know, crazed psychopath, which turned out to be Nikki Six, you know, leaning over the fucking barrier with this big red hammer bass. And of course, I didn't know anybody's name, or I didn't know what kind of guitar, but in looking back at old photos and becoming the 30-year, you know, hair metal freak that I am or became, I, I now look back and I'm like, well, that's what I saw, you know, like Nikki Six just probably coked out of his mind, just like, you know, doing that bass slide and beating him, shout at the devil. And it was just, I was like, oh my God, this is like the most insane thing I've ever seen or experienced. And then, you know, Tommy Lee's up there hitting the cymbals and then Vince runs out. And the guy's, you know, bleach blonde hair, tan, his shirt's off, wearing that leather, you know, contraption of a half vest, half, you know, belt kind of thing. And the girls were just, I mean, they would have murdered their fi family to suck his dick. You know, it was just like, <laughs> and, and I, at that point, I looked up there and I said, I'm going to do that. I didn't say, I want to do it. I don't say, I hope I can do it, or I'm going to try to do it, or wouldn't it be awesome to do that? I looked at that, and I said, I am going to do that. <laughs> you know, and subconsciously, I think in the back of my mind, I was thinking, that dude can't even sing. <laughs> He's just up there like, oh, 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 you know. <laughs> and at one point, the place, I mean, I was just, if they would have brought me backstage that night and said, kid, this is goat's blood. Drink it out of this skull right now. I would have fucking drank it. I wouldn't have questioned it. I would have said, yes, Mr. Six, whatever you, I'll pour it on me. Let me drink the blood. I mean, I just, so it was at that point that I became blinded to the outside world that, you know, at that point in my life, nothing mattered but Motley Crue. And then soon after, you know, Rat and black and blue and docking and and within that same six month period I saw Van Halen with David Lee Roth which I you know I was again I was looking at the stage going oh my god this is the guy's job he like stops the show and goes oh, oh stop the music stop the music hey buddy I think I might just fuck your girlfriend later I'm thinking that's his job he just tells guys he's gonna fuck their chick like, oh, my God, how do I get in this, you know? So it was David Lee Roth and Vince Neil that turned my ear, uh, like I said, very late in life. So I became obsessed with wanting to be in a band. Um, and it was about a year later in 1985, in the spring, I was 19 when we played, uh, you know, I played my first show live. And I just, I don't know, I took to it like a fish to water. And ever since then, it was, you know, it was something that, you know, if I thought, if it wasn't in my DNA before, I, you know, somehow Nikki threw some lamb's blood into the audience and it became part of my DNA in March of 84, you know, so. And did you jump right into a band or did you take vocal training? How did you do it? No vocal training at all. Uh. You know, what, what ensued then was, you know, anybody with a Def Leppard shirt on at school or, you know, you know, you, after a concert, you'd see a kid that had a rat shirt or a docking shirt and you'd start going to music stores and you'd see a kid, you know, buying a chord for his Charvel guitar that he had back at home. And we're like, really? Which one is it? You know, it's like the one the guy from docking has. We're like, dude, can we come over and see that? Like, we just were like, <laughs> um... And so that was basically like, then it became, hey, on Saturday, everybody's going to Goober's house. Uh, Goober was uh, a kid named Dan Lautenschlager, who was a drummer, who had a garage with a drum set or a basement. And, and then it was like, you know, Darren's coming over with his guitar rig and Mike's bringing his bass. And 
you know, Mike's, the other Mike's going to bring his guitar rig. And, you know, there was all these guys that would get together and jam. And what would happen is there'd be a couple of drummers and there'd be, you know, everybody wanted to play guitar or was trying to play guitar and a couple of bassists and everybody was kind of taking turns with the whole, do you know breaking the law? Do you know breaking the law? I know breaking the law. I, I can play breaking the law, you know? And so all these guys were practicing these songs. And at one point it became obvious that there was more guitarists and drummers and bass players than I guess could play at one time. And there really wasn't any singers. And so I, at one point, I remember they were playing, um, I think they were playing white wedding by Billy Idol, you know? And, um, they were playing the, you know, the riff, and then everyone started jamming. And I just was like, grabbed the mic and, you know, it's a nice day for a white wedding. And, you know, wow. And, you know, a couple of girls in the garage were like, you know, squealing and looking at me. And, and the guys were like, Steve, you know, you're going to be the singer. And I'm like, yeah, damn, right, I'm the fucking singer, <laughs> you know? So it was just kind of like, that's how it was. And so then it was, a whole like let's get together at this guy's house or that guy's house. And after, after that went on for a few months, it became a little bit more of let's narrow down who the guys are that can actually do this, you know, drummer, bassist, couple guitarists. And, you know, I became pretty, uh, I don't know, I guess you could call it alpha male at one point where I was like, you know, I, I wanted to take control and take the bull by the horns because I just, I had, I had a drive, you know, and it was like, there was things that happened that I remember us planning a rehearsal and getting to a guy's house and it was like, oh, well, you know, I, I'm actually taking my girlfriend bowling tonight or something like that. And I'm like, what? You mean we came all the way over here and you're going to a, to a bowling alley? Like, are you kidding? <laughs> I, I've got my zebra belt on. I have, you know, I've got my wristbands on, dude. Like, that ain't going to work, you know? And I, I, I was just like, anybody that put anything before the band, I was like, we need a different guy, you know? Um, and, and so I just, I, I became, like I said, blinded to everything else. And I was very committed to working forward, you know, whether it went rehearsal or playing a gig and, you know, over the course of a couple of years, I played in a couple of projects. The first one was called Exciter. And the second one kind of had a, a variation of names. First, it was Talon. They were called Talon with a different singer. But um, I think then we realized there was another Talon somewhere else. And we were going to call it Tommy Gun. And then we were going to play in Milwaukee. And we realized there was a Tommy Gun in Chicago, which fast forward some years became the same Tommy Gun that eventually moved from Chicago to L.A. And and so I did that for a couple of years with, I don't know, eight or 10 different guys from in and around Wisconsin. But I, I kind of knew that I think in, subliminally I was honing my craft and I knew at, at 19 playing my first show, I wasn't ready to be in LA yet. But by the time I was 21 and I'd already played 20, 30 shows and felt like I was, you know, a few steps ahead of, ahead of everyone else, or at least I, I wanted to be a few steps ahead of everyone else. And sometimes it was like guys that were just going in a different direction or weren't probably thinking the same things that I was. That's when I was like, time to, to make the move. And then, you know, I came to realize that this band tough was already in, in, in the process of, you know, had put their foot down in LA, but their singer had left and they were looking for one. And that was me. So when you got to L.A., you were kind of the, the classic country boy going to L.A. to make your dreams. So you found Tough there, or did you already know about them? Well, what's weird is I, I, I had, I knew a couple of people that had come to L.A., a couple of girls I dated and a friend or two, a guy that was a drummer. And one of the girls I had dated had come, had come to L.A. for a few months and then come home. And in the end of 1986, and she had some flyers and magazines. And um, I remember just looking through a bunch of the stuff. And at one point she had said she had dated one of the guys 
in the band Tough. And then she showed me their picture. And I remember thinking, like, their their flyer, their picture, their logo, they had, like, endorsements listed, you know, BC Rich or whatever. It, just, it, seemed, it seemed more legit than a, a lot of the other handbills and flyers and magazines, you know, pictures I'd seen the band. It was, it was very professionally put together, you know. And this is six, eight months before I met them. And um, I remember just thinking that, you know, they looked like they were on the level of whoever was coming up at that point, you know, Poison, King Cobra, you know, Doc and whatever. And so uh, I remember uh, six months later, eight months later, my buddy uh, Al had come out here to be, uh, you know, to check out the scene. He was a drummer. And he did the same thing. He came back to Wisconsin in June of 87 was like, Steve, I went to LA. There's all this stuff. Oh my God, it's crazy. I want to tell you about it. And so then um, I went to his house and I was just, you know, I was a fiend for information about all this. And he told me all these things, you know, about going to the rainbow and you saw David Lee Roth. And I mean, that kind of, you know, little thing now sounds kind of goofy, but to a kid who was 19, 20 years old back in Wisconsin, Oshkosh of all places. I was in Hollywood at the Rainbow on Sunset Boulevard. I was like, "Oh my God, did you fucking explode or what?" You know, I was just so enthralled with what he was telling me. And then he's like, "Look at all these flyers and magazines, and the bands are all so badass, and everybody's got the best equipment." And and so I'm looking through all this stuff, and at one point there's a tough flyer, and it's you know immediately caught my eyes. I'm like, I recognize that, but it was. George in a square and Michael in a square and Todd in a square. And then there was an empty square and it said wanted lead singer. And it said right on there, wanted lead vocalist, David Lee Roth, Vince Neil, Brett Michaels type, you know? And I had been playing around Wisconsin for a couple of years. And, you know, I had just come to know of poison in the previous six or eight months because they had just exploded, you know? And when I saw them, in the fall of 86 live, I thought, wow, these guys are like Motley Crue and Van Halen mixed, you know? Um, which essentially they were, they were the next coming of that type of band. And I, I saw them open for choir, Riot, And I was like, man, these guys are like, you know, like a baby Van Halen. And, but everyone's cooler looking because, you know, at that point, Van Halen had already, I don't want to say run its course, but you know, the Alex Van Halen's and the Mike Lanthony's didn't, look as cool as the C.C. DeVille's and the Bobby Dolls of that, of that, you know, time frame. So I, you know, immediately knew uh, I, I liked them as well. So when their flyer said wanted, you know, the David Lee Roth, Vince Neil type front man, I was like, well, fuck. Here I am, except for I'm in the 414 area code. It's <laughs> not really helping out, you know. And um, so I, I literally, uh, over over a course of 48 hours, made the decision that I was going to basically go to L.A. I, I, I called them originally, and there was like a voicemail that was like disconnected, and then there was like a studio number they used, and I called there, and they said, oh, you need to send a promo pack. So they asked me to send, you know, demo tapes and, you know, publicity shots and a bio and all this kind of stuff, which I, you know, I had some stuff from Wisconsin, but it just wasn't at the caliber of what I'm looking at in all these LA magazines. And I thought, if I send them this, this is just going to get thrown in the trash, you know? So I said, you know, I've got to, I've got to move. So I literally moved out of my apartment, called my mom. I said, I'm putting everything in the basement you know, over the weekend, I'm leaving next week. I, I went to my job. I asked for, you know, I told him I was quitting. I wanted my check cut to me. And I went to uh, Fox Valley Travel on Main Street in Oshkosh, and I bought a one-way plane ticket from Chicago O'Hare um, six days after I saw that flyer. I bought the ticket like three days later. So I, I moved within less than a week. I was less than a week I was here. I, I, I got the flyer on Friday at Al's house out, uh, out in West Haven, Wisconsin, which is outside of Oshkosh. And the following Monday, I bought the plane ticket. Thursday, I flew to L.A. And on Thursday night, I met some friends in the apartment building I stayed at. And Friday, they took me to the Troubadour, and I saw Angora headline with John Karabi on vocals. Cool. <laughs> Seven days, <laughs> you know. And I remember seeing them and thinking, wow. 
these guys are like Cinderella's worst nightmare. I mean, they were just, they were great. John was great. The band was great. Oddly, I didn't notice at the time, you know, that they were also from, from uh, Philadelphia and that, you know, actually were friends with and had ties to those, those guys from Cinderella and Britney Fox all these years later. But yeah, within a week's time, I had made the decision, moved out of my apartment, quit my job, parked my 1972 Buick Electra piece of shit used car in my mom's driveway and bailed. <laughs> if it wasn't tough, there would have been another band I'm sure you would have gotten into, but it is pretty absurd to to move across the country to hope to maybe get an audition for an unsigned band. <laughs> well, you know, and and absurd, but, you know, ballsy. It's, you oh, know, totally. You call it a few things. But at oh, the same totally. time, it's, it's, it's like I had said about, you know, guys I had jammed with in, in Wisconsin, which I, I, you know, at the time I, you know, I was, I was learning. I wasn't a great singer. Um, but I had an element of drive and determination and tenacity that I was just, you know, I was there, you know, and, uh, not, not to, not to brag and pat myself on the back too hard and break my own arm doing it, but, I, I remember going to shows in Brown County Arena or, you know, at some of these big events and seeing Dawkins with King Cobra or Sammy Hagar with whoever. And I would walk into these places and people would come up to me and ask, can, can I, you know, can I have a picture with you? Or who are you? Like, I, I already looked, I looked like I should have been on the stage, but I was, you know, living in Oshkosh. <laughs> so at one point I think I was cut out to be that guy, you know, um, like you said, whether I was going to end up in tough or somewhere else, but I was very driven to um, do what I had set out to do from the first time I saw, you know, Motley Crue and Vince Neil and Van Halen with David Roth. I was like, I'm going to do that, you know, and uh, and did whatever I had to to um, achieve it and back it up as far as just being, you know, and I think I naturally had just, aside from not being able to sing that well in the beginning, I just had a natural ability to, be be confident with you know with that type of uh, charismatic presence once I walked out on stage or whatever you know. And how did you get the audition for Tough? Well, I I had called them like I said when I was in Wisconsin, and they had requested me to send a package, which I never sent. So then it's a week later, I fly out. I fly out six days later, and then the weekend passes. And on that Monday, I left a, a message. I called that same studio, and I said, hey. I want to leave a message for the band Tough. My name is Steve. I'm from Wisconsin. I called about a week ago, um, and I'm in Los Angeles now. And then the, the lady had said, I think we talked to you, and you were going to send a package. And I said, I didn't send a package, but I'm here now. I'm in Los Angeles. I'm, I'm staying in Van Nuys. Here's the phone number where I can be reached. And, and she was like, okay, I'll pass it on to them. You know. And so uh, about two days later, Michael called me. And um, he was kind of the leader of the band and just said, hey, you know, we got your message. What's up? You know, and I said, well, I, you know, I'm here from Wisconsin. I want to audition for your band. And he said, well, we, you know, we already have a singer, a new guy, but we, we're not sure if we like him. Um, I don't remember what he said. He said he was lame or something like that. Uh, but he said he's, he's already living with us. I was like, really? <laughs> so you, you, you got a new singer. You don't like him. You think he's lame, but he's living in your house. You know, in your apartment, and he's like, "Well, yeah, it's a weird situation, but <laughs> it's complicated." So, yeah, you know. So then he just they just <laughs> said, "Well, you know, where are you? Where are you staying?" And I said, "I'm staying." And, and of course, again, you know, this was 27 years, 20 years ago. I, I didn't know where I was, but I was like, "Well, I, I live in an apartment on Sherman Way uh, in Van Nuys, and this is the address." And he goes, "Where?" And I go, you know, one four five two seven Sherman Way. It's by like a Seven Eleven and a hot dog shack, which is called Law Dog. It was kind of people would know it if they lived in the valley. And he goes, Oh my God, we live like right around the corner from there. And they lived oh, at like one four three two seven Van Owen Street, off the you know one major cross street over um, from where I was. And uh, so then they said, Well, we're going to come over tomorrow night at seven o'clock. We want to meet you. And I was like, Okay. And again you know, all these years later, looking back, I mean, the fact that I flew from 
Oshkosh, Wisconsin to Los Angeles, I could have ended up anywhere. I could have ended up in Long Beach or Ventura or Camarillo or Santa Monica, Venice, Hollywood. I could have ended up in a hundred different suburbs. But where I ended up was literally like one half mile from their apartment. I mean, I was literally around the corner from them. So they came over that in a couple, you know, night later or something and, you know, played me their tapes and I played them a couple demos that I had and, you know, they asked me a couple questions and if I wanted to come down and jam like a couple days later and I was like, yeah, you know, I'm ready, you know, and they're like, well, here's the songs and, and then they're like, well, you know, our singer that used to be in the band is a vocal teacher and we'll give you his vocal tapes too if you want to actually practice them. And it was actually Jim Gillette was their original singer, and he, they gave me the, the recordings they had done with Jim, but they also gave me his vocal tapes, which was called Metal Power, a vocal lesson he was telling in the Prater magazine. So <laughs> funny to think back, and, you know, to this day, me and Jim are still friends. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was, it was a weird little scenario. So then uh, within a couple of – within a week, we, we had jammed, and they said, okay, you're the guy. And, you know, they said something funny, like the first night they had a meeting and they're like, well, we want you to be our light guy or something like that. And I was like, fuck off. <laughs> and they were like, just kidding. And then, um, and then Michael went to work, you know, he booked us a photo shoot, you know, my, my clothes sucked. He took me to Melrose. My hair was short. He's like, we're going to get you some hair extensions, you know, it took me to fucking get hair extensions. I mean, the whole deal, you know, it was like, let's make over this Midwest, you know, farm boy. And so then we booked our first show, which we played on a bill with Warrant in August of 87. That was our first show. And how quickly did things take off for you then? You know, pretty much immediately. I mean, you know, it's no surprise. Everyone said it for years that, you know, I was the Brett Michaels lookalike or we were the poison wannabes. But, you know, we, we were no more poison wannabes and I was no more a Brett wannabe than Brett wanted to be David Lee Roth or Vince Neil, you know, um, we all wanted to be David Lee Roth at one point and, and Vince Neil. And, you know, when, when somebody else suddenly sells 10 million records, it's like, yeah, I, I'd like to be like that guy and sell 10 million records. And the fact that me and Brett had a very similar look, so, you know, he's from the Midwest and German with blonde hair and blue eyes and fair skin. And, you know, I mean, we, we could have been almost, you know, from the same gene pool, so to speak, if you take a look at us, it's not like I look like, Charlie Sexton, you know, I mean, so, and the fact that they became at that point, they had just exploded in like that six months previous. So the fact that tough now had this baby Brett Michaels looking guy fronting their band, it was, you know, it was, you know, it, it, it helped. I mean, I think it helped and hurt at one point where people were just wanted to continue to throw that in our face. But I think, you know, I think at one point we, 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 made enough of an impact that it wasn't just okay does the guy look like Brett Michaels okay well who cares you know we're playing shows we're selling merchandise girls liked us you know our guitar player was good our band was solid and you know so I mean it was it was almost instant I mean you know within a couple of couple of weeks to a month we were like you know getting written up in the in the local Hollywood rags and but you know Rock City News I think was I think it was a weekly or a bi-weekly paper and all those papers were just exploding because, and, and mind you, I joined tough before guns and roses record was even out. So, I mean, this, you know, faster pussycat had just come out. LA guns was just coming out. Poison had been out about a year, but it only started to sell a lot of records like in the spring of 87, early 87. And I joined their band, you know, in July of 87. So, you know, it, it happened fairly quickly that we became uh, a huge interest and draw. But I think a lot of people did, just based on the fact that Poison was the first band in not a long time, but, you know, in, in more than a few years that really exploded. Because Motley and Rat came out, like, in the end of 83, 84. And there was a lot of others that followed, the Black and Blues. And, and, and I... I don't want to say follow because I think black and blue was even there before Molly and Rad, just that they didn't have as much success, but it was just more exposure for the, the crocuses and the, 
and, and, and the black and blues and the Dawkins that Motley and Rat had such huge success, you know, and, and Quiet Riot. You know, those bands had sold two, three, four million records, which really put certain bands on the map. And, and a lot of those other bands had records that came out, but not to the point where when Poison exploded, it was, you know, they went from zero to double and triple platinum in a matter of like six or nine months, you know. So that just kind of gave it, you know, and, and because they were like, you know, a lot of people said, oh, they suck, they can't play, they don't have good songs, they're just a joke, you know, you know pop, candy, gum, bubble gum. Well, all that stuff that was said went out the window when they suddenly sold three million records and were on the cover <laughs> of every magazine. Yeah. And people were like, okay, maybe there is some other good bands on this Sunset Strip, you know? And how long did it take for you guys to get signed? Well, that's, you know, that was the... That was the heartache that we didn't actually sign our contract until like the summer fall of 1990. And, you know, when I joined uh, tough, it was the summer of 87. So that's three solid years there, you know, to 88 to 89 to 90. Uh, mind you, previous to that, I was doing my thing for two years and tough was doing their thing for two years. They had formed in early 85 and even with Jim Gillette had been in LA for almost a year and, um, you know, there was a little bit of a, uh, you know, some family bloodline there in the industry that kind of opened a few doors. You know, Todd Chason's older brothers uh, were Kenny Chason from Keel and Greg Chason, who eventually was in Badlands. But Greg was kind of locked in and, you know, an industry fave with some guitarists. And I think he had, you know, he was, an, you know, a guy that got, a, you know, an audition for Ozzy and, you know, so he had some older brothers that had kind of been in this industry, you know, through the early 80s, you know, through the metal, uh, you know, the the metal uh, ranks of some of those bands. So with Todd being the baby brother who, you know, suddenly came to L.A., there was a couple of companies that were willing to, you know, endorse us. And, and um, Michael was a very very savvy business guy. He was, he was the leader of the band, even though he was the youngest. And mind you, when I joined tough, I was 21 and I was the oldest guy in the band. So Todd and George were still 20 and Michael uh, had just turned 19. So, you know, we had youth on our side as well that we weren't, you know, at that point, if you were 27 with a mustache, it was like, you know, you were already an old guy, you know, guys in Blue Oyster Cult, you know, <laughs> so. It's 1990. I think hair metal is probably just peaking. It's before right. Nirvana. You get signed uh, mm -hmm. and you end up working with Howard Benson. How did he get involved and how was he to work with? Well, you know, at that point, we had done some demos with a few different people, uh, one being Jesse Harms who was a keyboard player that played with Sammy Hagar and went on to play with David Lee Roth. And he produced a demo for us at Sound City in 88. And then um, we worked with another producer named Warren Croyle, who produced a demo um, at Sunset Sound Factory in 89. And, um, you know, those couple of demos were, you know, pretty high in production as well. Obviously, we recorded at Sound City in the big room and uh, Sunset Sound Factory in these places they were churning out big records, you know, so we had uh, some really high quality demos. Um, and we had been in studio, you know, a handful of times with guys like that. So, but when we got an actual deal with Atlantic records, you know, it's that whole, that whole, you've heard it before, you know, getting signed is the first step, you know, and that's the big, that's the big dream for all the guys. Like, oh, we're going to get signed. We're getting signed. We're doing a showcase. We're getting signed, you know, but once that happens, now it's a whole new, basket of things you need to sort through and at one point one of them was picking a producer which i can say looking back at that point i was 24 uh i turned 24 in march of 90 so it was the summer so i'm 24 and the other two guys are 23 and michael's 22 and and now we're having to meet a couple of producers how they came to our attention i don't even remember but between our manager uh, Brian Kushner from Power Star, who also managed Britney Fox. I think they had a gold or a platinum record. And, you know, they obviously had a little bit of a, a niche going there. And then people at Atlantic 
you know, they, they threw some names at us. And one of them was George Tuck, uh, George Tuck Ho, who uh, recently just passed away. He was a really nice guy. Um, came to rehearsal with us, submitted some proposal as to how he would break the budget down and how he would, you know, produce it, doing what and where and which studios. And, and then at one point, Howard was another guy that came to, uh, to the forefront. Now, how he was suggested or referred, I don't know, but he obviously at that point had already put his hands in, you know, Bang Tango and Pretty Boy Floyd. And, uh, I think South Gang had done a record just before us. So he was working with bands, of our ilk, you know, that we're all from the, you know, the same kind of thing. And, and so, uh, you know, same thing happened again, where Howard came in, we met with him, he submitted a budget and a proposal. And I do remember him sitting in rehearsal and just being a little bit more, I would say, you know, just a little bit more ballsy. I want to produce this. You guys need to pick me. I, I want to produce this record, you know? And, and, um, and at that point, you know, honestly, I, I, I was not completely aware of how all the things worked. I mean, none of us were, but I mean, looking back, even at the time I was 30, I looked back and went, Oh, okay. Now I kind of know what our manager was doing there, you know, and fast forward 25 years as I managed to gain the Jenna, the Swedish band for a while, I, I, I was having flashbacks of going, Oh my God, I feel like, Brian Kushner and, you know, my buddy Brent Woods, you know, he's like Howard Benson right now. I want to murder these fucking kids, you know, <laughs> which I'm sure everybody at one point was thinking like this Stevie and George guy, they're fucking killing me. Like, you know, but, uh, Howard, Howard, um, you know, produced our record and, you know, I, I heard the, uh, the mess, the, the, the interview where he, he, I, I guess doesn't recall a lot of working with us, but, I mean, I don't expect him to. He's done probably a hundred bands since, and obviously, you know, ninety-five of them. Well, maybe not any. Probably eighty of them. You know, outsold us by a landslide. You know, I'd like to think we outsold a couple of his bands. <laughs> <laughs> maybe not recently, but um, you know, working with Howard, there's a lot of things that I learned from him many, many, many years later. You know, and um, and not just today or last year, but, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. And I remember, I remember working on lyrics for, you know, Only Generation or something. And, you know, working on it just for hours and hours and hours and thinking I had this really good set of verses and lines. And I'd bring it to him and he'd like, let me see what you got. And he'd, I hand him the spiral notebook and he'd look at it. And just like a teacher with a red pen. No, no, no. He like just starts crossing shit out, you know. At one point, he's like, this is a good line. This is a good word. Use this. Don't use that. And he'd hand it back to me. And it was like, it was like 80% wrong. I was just like, what the fuck? Really? <laughs> and uh, I remember him giving me some, um, some examples. Like, I remember, uh, for instance, it wasn't exactly this, but I said something in a lyric about, you know, and she's in a really fast car. And he goes, Stevie, let me explain something to you. He goes, you can't just say she's in a really fast car. He goes, you have to paint a picture of the fast car. Let's not use fast car. Let's use candy apple red Camaro. And I like, and it, it just popped in my head. I'm thinking now I see it. I see this beautiful candy apple red painted Camaro. I don't have to say it's fast. You already know it's fast. It's a, it's a sports car. It's a Camaro. It's got a sleek, you know, it's, it's a beautiful paint job that looks like it's wet, you know, in the, in the description of a candy apple red Camaro as opposed to she's in a fast car. I'm like, okay, I get it. And so he, he like taught me about being descriptive with my lyric, you know, even in one line. And, you know, years and years later, you know, I, I learned from that. And there was a lot of other things that I learned as well. Um, just by, just by being there, you know, and I, I, you know, I, I've seen his career skyrocket over the years and, um, you know, God, you know, congrats to him because, you know, and I, I can't, I can't speak for him, but you know, he couldn't get fucking arrested 
with a real band for a long time there, you know, meaning he couldn't get the Tom Worman or the Michael Wagner or the, you know, uh, the, the guys who were producing the Skid Rows and the Poisons and the Mollies and the Rats that are all selling two, three, five, and seven million records. Bob Rock, he couldn't get those gigs. But just like he said in his interview, it took him 15 years and working on obscure records for Motorhead and, you know, uh, suddenly he couldn't not fucking have a hit, you know, he's dealing with every huge band, you know, Daughtry and, and, uh, and all those, I think it was what Kelly Clarkson, like, you know, the, the biggest all that stuff. Yeah. Adam Lambert, all of it. You know, who to who to stank with the reason, you know, all these bands that just became humongous, humongous sellers. And like he said, it worked out for the better for him because, you know, a lot of those bands that got, pigeonholed as, well, they produced the Motley Crue and Skid Row and Bon Jovi, so we don't want them to do us, you know, and that's kind of how some of those producers got typecast, you know, um, just like the bands did, where Howard was able to, uh, like he said, he's happy it worked out that way. <laughs> okay, so the record comes out, and what was the response? You're talking 91, record comes out, how, how did uh, people react to it? Well, you know, I mean, our advertisement was as cocky and arrogant as we were. I mean, our arrogant or our, our advertisement said, "Believe the hype." Um, you know, uh, you know. I mean, and that was the Atlant the Atlantic Records full page, full color advertisement in every single magazine. You know, believe the hype in big letters across the top. You know, and at the end of the day, I mean, I really think we did deliver. You know, but. Like Howard said, had it been, you know, had we come out in 87 or 88, um, you know, and Howard say, you know, when he says, oh, we have a copy of a copy of a copy. Howard, not that you're listening, but if you are, come on. We know that, you know, but, you know, had I come out in 86 and Brett came out in 91, then, you know, he could, he could suck it and be my copy of a copy, you know? Um, so... You know, it's 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 not like I was trying to copy poison or warrant or anybody. You know, if I was if I was guilty of trying to copy anybody, it was David Lee Roth and Vince Neil. You know, and who were you know at one point everyone said you know David Lee Roth ripped off Jim Dandy and you know Steven Tyler ripped off Mick Jagger and so you know it's kind of like who gets there first. You know, and when somebody gets a record deal before somebody else, it suddenly puts you in the light of well, you're just trying to be them. It's just like, well, no, you, you know, you didn't even know I was here before, you know? And when I came to, to Hollywood in 87 and started walking around the Sunset Strip, um, of course, everybody was like, oh, my God, there's, you know, there's the guy that looks like Brett Michael. Um, but, you know, rewind one year in 1986, I'm playing Wisconsin and I'm going to Milwaukee and playing, you know, these clubs and going around to concerts and, and then at one point, some, some guys come up to me and they go, yeah, so-and-so said that your band's on Headbangers Ball. You know, and I'm like, what? And they're like, yeah, everyone's saying Steve's band, he's got a song on, on Headbangers Ball now. And they were talking about Cry Tough and Poison. And there was a bunch of people in Wisconsin that hadn't seen me in a while but knew I was in a band and then suddenly equated this, hey, Steve's band's on Headbangers Ball. And so there was some people there that thought, I was Brett Michaels and essentially were like, Oh, there's that guy that looks like Steve, you know, of course it was a much smaller contingency of people that were saying, there's the guy that looks like Steve. And that only happened for a few months. Um, and then once they became, you know, the next best thing since sliced bread, then it was, you know, there's Steve trying to look like that guy from the band on MTV playing talk dirty to me, you know? And you guys also came in probably one of the last, hair bands to come in before grunge like it was right at that line in fact well, Nirvana probably had already come out it, it took that a year for it to really happen too well yes and no I mean as and everybody knows this too Alice in Chains had been out for more than a year they were on tour opening for Van Halen and they were getting bottles thrown at them every night um and getting booed off the stage and Soundgarden had been around and I think Pearl Jam had just released their record but Nirvana, if you Google it, I'm going to say the release came out in September um, uh, of 1991. And our record came out in May. 
So our video for I Ain't Kissing Goodbye debuted in September of 1991 and at one point made it up to number three on Dial and TV behind Guns N' Roses. I'm guessing it was like Don't Cry or November Rain and then, you know, Metallica, Enter Sandman, and then Tough was number three. And then Nirvana debuted, you know, at number nine or something. So their record had come out in September um, of 91. And our record had already been out for, you know, the whole summer. But um, it wasn't grunge. Uh, you know, it wasn't... Nirvana was not the first grunge band to to come out. I mean, I think there was already some bands that had started releasing records. But they were the first one to impact the way they did. And what's really crazy, if you really think about it, Kurt killed himself in April of 94. I know, the it's kind of crazy, right? Yeah, he... He had, he, they were around for two and a half years. That's insane. That's absolutely insane. I mean, they came out in the fall of 91, and he was dead by April of 94. So in two and a half years, they made that much of an impact, you know? Um, and, you know, once, once that impacted the way it did, and then, you know, the Alice in Chains record had been out forever, but, you know, suddenly that stuff got more rotation and Pearl Jam. And then, you know, it was like, it was the same thing like right now with, with Dave Grohl. Dave Grohl could be in 20 projects right now and they're all going to be on the Billboard charts. It was that same way with the guys from Alice in Chains and Soundgarden and Pearl Jam. They were all in like five bands and they were all on the charts. <laughs> you know, the... um Temple of, what was it called? Temple of the Dog? Yeah, they had the Temple of the Dog, which was like, you know, one guy from this band and two guys from this band, another guy from that band, and, and then um, and then there was, uh, you know, the Mother Love Bone thing, which I think that singer, he died before the record came out, right? That's right, and I think that's part of Temple of the Dog, too, is like a tribute right. to him. Right, so, you know, there was, you know, and then all of their bands were suddenly you know, all over the place. And, um, and then, you know, Alice in Chains obviously put out the next record with the rooster and stuff like that on it, which was just, I always thought them to be more, I would say heavy metal because I think heavy metal is kind of a dumbed down term. And I think Alice in Chains is definitely more deep than that, but they were more of a, a heavier grunge band, you know? Um, Nirvana was the punker band and uh, the punkier sounding band. I think Pearl Jam was more of the classic rock sounding band. And then Soundgarden was a little bit, a little, a little faster and a little heavier, you know? Yeah, well, I've been up and down, town to town with several bands. Been tortured for ten- well, that's it for this week. I'll have part two of my chat with Stevie Rochelle for you next week. Remember, for all things Double Stop, check out thedoublestop.com. I'm Brian Sword. Thanks for listening.